Our next speaker is David Ha. David is a research scientist at Google, working in the brain team in Japan. His research interests include complex systems, self-organization, and creative applications of machine learning. Prior to join Google, he worked at Goldman Sachs as a managing director, where he co-ran the fixed income trading business in Japan. He obtained undergrad and master's degree from the University of Toronto and a PhD from the University of Tokyo. David, thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, my name is David Ha. I'm a researcher at Google in Japan, and today I'm going to give a talk about a topic that really excites me, which is about collective intelligence and how it can be used to improve AI. So let's begin. If you've been following the developments in the machine learning world over the last few years, you may have noticed some of the advances of artificial neural networks and that they're used for more and more applications from image classification to you know, using deep neural networks to now image generation using GANs, VAEs, and more recently diffusion models. They're used in machine translation, also in large language models like BERTs and GPT. Uh, they can not only be used for transcribing voice dialogues, but also generating voices and sounds. Um, recently, they can also be applied to these um, NERF models that can uh, stitch together real photographs based on coordinates and angles and reconstruct things that look like, uh, for example, a 3D map of San Francisco. But with all of these advances, uh, the impressive feats in deep learning involves a lot of sophisticated engineering. For instance, this network uh, is the famous uh, AlexNet, which made deep learning famous when, when it won the ImageNet competition you know, almost 10 years ago. And we can see details that were involved in its design. Modern networks are even much more sophisticated and require a pipeline that spans neural network architecture and careful training schemes. Lots of sweat and labor had to go into producing these amazing results. Recently, I've been fascinated with all of these uh, new text-to-image diffusion models like OpenAI's DALI2 and Google's Imogen. You know, these models demonstrate how effective deep learning networks are as a large neural uh, data sponge that can absorb huge amounts of data into the parameters of the neural networks and work with that data in non-trivial ways. You know, in a sense, like text-to-image is a form of image retrieval or image generation. But you know, under the hood, there's a lot going on. Like for instance, for diffusion models in this recent review paper, there's different sampling schemes, there's different architectures, and even the way you train them has to be very specifically carefully de designed so that it'll work. Otherwise, you know, you can get NANs and the training will blow up. And you know, so much work has, has to go be behind the scenes to make these amazing models work. And in this talk, uh, the theme that I want to discuss about is like, I believe the way we're currently doing deep learning is like engineering. I think we're building neural network systems the same way we are building bridges and buildings. I really like this quote from Andrew Pickering uh, from the book Cybernetics, where he says, bridges and buildings are all designed to be indifferent to their environment, to withstand fluctuations, not to adapt to them. The best bridge is one that just stands there, whatever the weather. But in natural systems where collective intelligence plays a big role, we see complex designs that emerge due to self-organization, such as you know, designs that usually are sensitive and responsive to the world around them. Natural systems adapt and become part of their environments. But it didn't have to be this way. The reason deep learning took its course could just be an accidental outcome in history. In fact, in the earlier days of neural network development from the 1980s, many groups, including the group led by Leon Chua, who is a legendary electrical engineer, worked on neural networks that are much closer to natural adaptive systems. They developed something called a cellular neural network, which are artificial neural network circuits with grids of artificial neurons. Each of these neurons would receive signals from their neighbors, perform a weighted sum operation, and apply a nonlinear activation function, just like how we do today, and send off a signal uh, to its neighbors. 
The difference between these networks and today's networks is that they were built using analog circuits, meaning that they would work approximately, but also at the time much faster than digital circuits. Also, the wiring of each cell is exactly the same. What's remarkable is that even in the late 1980s, <clears throat> they've shown that these networks can produce amazing results, such as object extraction. These analog uh, networks work in nanoseconds, something that we were only able to match decades later with digital circuits. They can be programmed to do non-trivial things. For, for example, like selecting all objects uh, in this pixel image that are pointing up <clears throat> and erasing all other objects. We were only able to do these tasks only decades later with deep learning. But in the last few years, I've been noticing many works in the deep learning research pop up that have been using many of these ideas from collective intelligence, in particular, the area of complex uh, systems, uh, where, where we discuss emergence. Recently, we even wrote a survey paper about these works, which I will discuss here. The problem is that collective intelligence is a huge topic, including topics that investigate actual you know, biological organisms like honeybees and ant colonies, so we will limit our discussion in only some of the areas focused on machine learning. Uh, in this talk, we'll discuss image processing, generative models using collective intelligence approach, uh, deep reinforcement learning, multi-agent learning, and finally meta-learning. <coughs> We start by discussing the idea of image generation from a collective intelligence standpoint. One example that I think of is this annual Reddit R place experiment. In this annual experiment, uh, Reddit set up a 1000 by 1000 pixel canvas, so a million pixels. Uh, but here they allow every, each Reddit user to draw a single pixel every five minutes. This experiment lasts for one week, allowing millions of Reddit users to draw whatever they want. But to take, make something really meaningful, users have to collaborate and coordinate a strategy uh, on the discussion forums to defend, attack other designs, and even form alliances. You know, this is because they have a limitation of drawing like one pixel every every uh, you know, every five minutes. So. Early algorithms uh, computed designs on a pixel grid as well. For an example is uh, the cellular autonoma uh, in the Conway's Game of Life, where the state of each pixel on a grid is computed based on a function that depends on the states of its neighbors from the previous time step. And based on simple rules, complex patterns can emerge. So in a recent work uh, called a neurocellular autonoma, this work tried to extend the concept of cellular autonoma, or CAs, but replace the simple rules with a neural network. So in a sense, it's really similar to the cellular neural networks from the 1980s that I discussed earlier. But in this work, they apply neural CAs to large uh, to image generation, just like the Reddit R place example uh, I discussed, where at each time step, a pixel will be randomly chosen and updated based on the output of a single neural network function whose inputs are the values of the pixel's immediate neighbors. Over time, they show that the neural CA can be trained to output any particular design based on a, a sparse stochastic sampling rule, just like the R-place experiments, uh, and you know, using an almost empty initial canvas. Here are some examples of three neural CAs producing three designs. What I think is remarkable about this method is that even when we see some corruption in the image, the algorithm would attempt to regenerate the corrupted parts and automatically, you know, like uh, in, in its own way. It's kind of like the in-painting. Neural CAs uh, can also perform prediction tasks in a collective fashion. Uh, for example, they can be applied to classify MNIST digit, digits, where the, the difference here compared to traditional methods is that each pixel must produce its own prediction based on its own pixel value uh, and the predictions made from its immediate neighbors. So its prediction will also influence the predictions of its neighbors too and change their opinions over time, like in a democratic society. So they're not able to see the entire image. They can only see one pixel and also the predictions from their neighbor. 
Over time, though, usually some consensus is made across the collection of pixels, uh, which corresponds to the actual image uh, or the actual label. But sometimes we can see interesting effects, like if the digit was written in a weird way, uh, there would be different steady states of predictions across different regions of the digit. Neural CDs are not confined to generating pixels. They can also generate voxels and 3D shapes. Recent work even used a neural CA to produce designs in Minecraft, which are sort of like pixels. Um, they can produce things like buildings and trees. And, but what's more, most interesting is that since some of the components inside Minecraft are active rather than passive, meaning they can move, uh, they can also generate functional machines with behavior. But here in this experiment, uh, they show that one of these uh, functional machines, this, this uh, creature walking forward, can be cut in half. And each half can regenerate itself morphogenetically uh, using a neural CA uh, to end up with two functional machines and each of them will walk forward. So uh, the idea of, of having machines move around brings us to the topic of deep reinforcement learning. Uh, which is another popular area within deep learning to train neural networks uh, for for tasks like you know like a like a local motion control. So here are a few examples of these Mujoko humanoid benchmark envir environments and their state of the art solutions. What happens in all of these? Uh, uh, what happens is that usually all of the input states in the case of the hu this humanoid uh, we have we actually have like 376 observations uh, data points they're all fed into a deep neural network uh, the policy network and this policy network would output all of the 17 actions required to control the joints of the humanoid for it to move forward what usually happens is that these networks tend to overfit to the training environment so you end up with solutions that only work for this exact design and this exact environments we've seen some pretty cool works recently that look at using a co collective uh, controller approach for these problems though uh, in particular in this paper uh, rather than having one policy network take all of the inputs and output all of the actions. Here, they use a single shared policy network for every joint in the agents, effectively decomposing an agent into a collection of small individual agents connected together by limbs. So these policies uh, or individual agents can communicate with each other bidirectionally. So they can communicate bidirectionally with their immediate neighbors. So over time, uh, they show that a, a global policy can emerge only from local coordination, just like the MNIST uh, classification example earlier. Not only do they train this policy for one agent design, but it also must work across dozens of designs in the training set. So the same controller that controls one small part of a limb is applied to all of these different creatures uh, in their training set. Uh, so here, uh, Every one of these agents are controlled by the exact same policy that governs every joint. So, and uh, the, the point is they show that this type of collective system has some interesting zero shot generalization capabilities that can control agents uh, with not only different design variations with different li limb lengths and masses, but also novel designs not in the training sets and they can also deal with unseen challenges like like having some objects well why rely on a fixed design another work uh here looks at why not have the limbs figure out a way to self-assemble and reconfigure itself into some optimal design to perform uh, the task at hand like uh, balancing and locomotion uh, in this work uh they show that this kind of self-configuration approach can generalize to cases even when you have double or half the number of limbs the system was originally trained on, something that's simply not possible with traditional deep RL. Uh, even a system trained with traditional deep RL would work uh, on a fixed number of limbs, 
but the self-assembling solutions consistently prove to be more robust to unseen challenges, like such as wind, or in the case of locomotion, be able to handle new types of terrain, such as hurdles and stairs. So this type of, uh, this, I would say, collective policy making uh, can be applied to image-based reinforcement learning tasks too. So where the inputs of the environment is uh, is image grid. In a recent NeurIPS paper from my group, led by uh, Eugene Tang, we looked at feeding each patch from a video feed from the, of the environments uh, into identical sensory neuron units. And these sensory neurons must figure out the context of their own input channel and then uh, self-organize using an attention mechanism for, attention, uh, for communication to collectively output motor commands for the agent. This allows the agents to still work even when the, all the patches on the screen are shuffled and continually reshuffled. And this work uh, is inspired by the idea of sensory substitution, where different parts of the brain can be retrained to process different sensory modalities, enabling us to adapt our senses to crucial information sources. Uh, as an example to a locomotion task like this ANTS agent, uh, we can apply the method and shuffle the ordering of all of the 28 inputs quite frequently even. And our agents here will quickly adjust uh, itself to a dynamic observation space and continue to do the task at hand. Uh, what's remarkable is uh, we can even get the agent to play a, a shuffled uh, puzzled version of a Pong game where the patches are constantly reshuffled. So I didn't expect this to work at the beginning. And what's remarkable is that uh, the system can also work with partial information, like only when 70% of the patches uh, are all shuffled. We find some unexpected benefits from this system too, like the ability to work with different backgrounds uh, that it hasn't seen during training. Uh, it's only seen the green grass background of the car racing environments, uh, but it's working on other backgrounds here. So uh, the earlier reinforcement learning examples I discussed were mainly about decomposing a single agent into a smaller collection of agents. But what we do know from complex systems is that emergence uh, often occurs at much larger scales than 10 or 20 agents. Perhaps we need a collection of thousands or you know, more, more individual agents to interact together meaningfully for a complex superorganism to emerge. A few, year a few years back, there was this paper that looked at taking advantage of hardware accelerators like GPUs to enable significant scaling up of multi-agent reinforcement learning. In this work, called M agents, they propose a framework to get up to 1 million agents, uh, though pretty simple ones, uh, to engage in various grid world multi-agent environments. And furthermore, they, they can have a population of agents pit together against another popular agent, uh, population of agents uh, in, a, in a collective self-play manner. The hardware revolution brought about by deep learning can enable us to take advantage of the hardware and use them to train truly large-scale collective behavior. In some of these experiments uh, in M agents, they show that uh, predator-prey loops and encirclement tactics emerge from truly large-scale multi-agent reinforcement learning. These uh, macro-level collective intelligence will pro probably not emerge from traditional small-scale multi-agent environments that we usually see in the literature, where we only have like two, four, or maybe eight agents. <clears throat> I would like to note that this work was from 2018, and hardware acceleration progress has only exponentially increased since then. A recent demo from NVIDIA last year showed a physics engine that can now handle thousands of agents acting in a realistic physics simulation, unlike the simple grid world environment uh, in the previous slide. I believe that in the future, we could see really interesting studies of emergent behavior using these newer technologies. Uh, I will end with a discussion of how collective behavior is applied to meta-learning. Uh, these increases in compute capabilities 
won't just stop at simulation. We all know that a simple uh, MNIST classification network requires not that much hardware, since our concept of artificial neural networks right now are simply you know, weight matrices uh, between nodes and doing a matrix multiplication uh, within a nonlinear activation function. But with the extra compute, we can now also explore really interesting directions where we can simulate generalized versions of neural networks where perhaps every neuron is an identical multi-layer artificial neural network. Recently, in, in the neuroscience literature, there's actually many papers exploring this theme of modeling a biological neuron with a, with a deep neural network. But rather than neurons, though, recently in machine learning research, we've seen some pretty ambitious works modeling the synapse uh, of a neural network as a recurrent neural network. This is because uh, when we look at how a standard neural network is trained, we go through the forward pass of the network uh, to forward propagate the inputs of the network to the output. And then we use back propagation, uh, the algorithm, to back prop the error signals back from the output layer all the way to the input layer. <clears throat> and via this algorithm, it uses the, the gradients computed to adjust the weights. So this is how a standard neural network works. But in this scheme, uh, where the synapses are replaced by recurrent neural networks, uh, rather than relying on this forward and back propagation uh, algorithm, we can model uh, each synapse of a neural network with an RNN, a recurrent neural network. Uh, and an RNN is a universal computer, uh, so it can compute anything. And it, it can learn how to best forward and back propagate the signals, in a sense, learning how to learn. Uh, the hidden states of each RNN would essentially define the weights uh, in a highly plastic way. So they, they, can, they can move around, uh, they can adjust itself whenever they're performing inference. So these recent works have also shown that these approaches are a strict generalization of backpropagation. Uh, a paper here uh, even ran the experiments to train these meta-learning networks exact to exactly replicate the backpropagation algorithm so that they show that this generalization can also perform stochastic gradient descents. But more importantly, uh, they can evolve learning rules that learn much more efficiently than stochastic gradient descent or even Adam because of their, their generalized uh, capabilities. In one experiment, uh, they trained this type of meta-learning system called a variable shared uh, learner on the blue line to learn a learning rule using only the MNIST dataset, uh, where the learning rule here outperforms backprop, SGD, and Adam baselines, which is expected since the learning rule here is only fine-tuned to the MNIST dataset. But when they test this uh, learning rule that was learned on MNIST on a new dataset, like fashion MNIST, they see similar performance gains. So I would like to emphasize that these works are still in their very early stages, <clears throat> but I think these approaches of modeling neural networks uh, as a truly collective set of, in the, of identical neurons or identical synapses uh, rather than a fixed unique weights parameter are really promising direction that will really change the subfield of meta-learning inside uh, AI. So in summary, uh, well, I, I hope this talk would convince everyone that collective, collective intelligence can help move the needle in machine learning. In this talk, I discuss systems that can adapt to the, its environments. Uh, we show that these systems are generally robust, uh, more robust to out of distribution shifts have some generalization capability. And I believe that uh, these collective systems are going to be a key ingredient for systems that can learn to learn. Uh, recently, we published this, uh, col this uh, paper called A Collective Intelligence for Deep Learning, a survey of recent developments, uh, and it's going to be published in the ACM Journal of Collective Intelligence this month. And uh, thank you.